Curatato, and welcome to this PowerPoint presentation on Antarctica and the New Zealand Antarctic Society, put together in June 2024 by myself and, Noc and Dr. Natalie Robinson. This presentation will be in three parts. The first part is a review of what happens in Antarctica and a brief introduction to each of these systems. This might act as a bit of a review for those that have been to the Antarctic previously or have studied it. So we'll be looking at a bit of geology, metrology, seasonal variations, marine and ocean systems and so on and then move on to the links the rest of the world. The next part of course we will move on to the critical issues for Antarctica uh, and we'll only have time for a few of these obviously so we'll look particularly at uh, climate change and what I'd like to do when I'm talking about this is make the link between what's happening here in our normal lives, what's happening in, there in Antarctica and then what's happening back here in our normal lives and as part of that we'll talk about the ocean circulation patterns, plastics, pathogens, storms and biodiversity and so on. And then the third part we'll look at the Antarctic Society and what is uh, the Antarctic Society, who we are, what, we're, what we do and what we're trying to do. So looking at geology 170, 180 million years ago, Antarctica was part of a supercontinent called, called Gondwana when the Earth's continental crust formed a large continent. Since then, since that period until now, this continental crust has fragmented, forming tectonic plates that have drifted apart across the surface of the Earth. Uh, you can see there Antarctica and New Zealand, Australia, South America and so forth. Uh, this has been demonstrated through the geology of the Antarctic margin uh, which closely matches the geology of adjacent clients and so forth, uh, adjacent continents. And if we look at Antarctica itself, ge geolog geologically it's in two parts. East Antarctica which forms part of the original old supercontinent of Gondwana and this has formed of old igneous and metamorphic rocks that have been laid down. You can see some of these in the Beacon Sandstones, uh, which are originally marine sediments that have been buried, compressed and heated and uplifted before um, being exposed. These are typified here from around 200 uh, metres of light coloured Beacon Sandstone deposited from 400 to 200 million years ago with coal beds and fossil forests in the upper part. The dark layers of Farrar dolerite sills, uh, Balsanic magma injected 180 million years ago as the supercontinent broke up. But West Antarctica, of course, is more similar to South America and the Andes to the north, uh, where these processes of subduction and uplifting and volcanism. So, those two distinct geological zones really, and they're separated in that dashed line you can see there, which closely corresponds with the Transantarctic Mountains that run through the centre. So moving on to metrology, the sun of course affects different parts of the earth at different places, quite obvious I suppose, and the place closest to the equator gets more solar radiation than the poles. And therefore the Antarctic and the Antarctic of course are colder, and because of that the, uh, the continent of Antarctica, the overlying air is cold, and that cold air sinks. So because cold air sinks, you've got this permanent high pressure zone over the continent of Antarctica. And then as that air flows down uh, from the centre of Antarctica outwards, it comes down off the polar plateau, probably at about minus 15, minus 20, and then it reaches the ocean, which is relatively warmer. It could be 1 degree, 0 degree, minus 1 degree. Hence, when that relatively cold air uh, hits the relatively warm water of the ocean, uh, the, the temperature gradient is quite high, and therefore the, uh, the warm air, the cold air starts warming and it starts rising, forming low pressure system. And because we're in the southern ocean, Coriolis effects means that that air rising is then rotating clockwise and so therefore you get all of these low pressure systems spiralling around Antarctica. And if we look at a, a weather map from early June, you can see here, if you look closely, you can see the low pressure zones around the margins of Antarctica and of course the high pressure zone 
in the center. So moving on to seasonal variations, uh, the ice sheet itself is around 50 times the size of New Zealand, that's the permanent ice sitting on over the continent. And then of course during the winter the sea ice grows and that's another 50 times the size of New Zealand, in effect doubling the size of Antarctic. And we'll see that the sea ice is very important in a moment. Then around Antarctica and, and underlying extending beyond the sea ice is the Southern Ocean. This is part of the global ocean patterns and circulation systems. Once again, we'll have a look at that in a moment. But there are seasonal variations. So during the winter, the sea ice grows along the surface of the, of the ocean and along the margins of Antarctica. It continues to grow right out till probably <coughs> excuse me, late September, early October. And then that time of the year in the spring, solar radiation starts increasing uh, and then you, the sea ice acts a bit like a greenhouse. So underneath the base of the sea ice you have a whole lot of algae and phytoplankton growing and then the krill, the small shrimp crustaceans come along and feed off those in turn and then of course larger animals and mammals like penguin seals and whales come along and feed off those. So the sea ice and underneath the sea ice is really the production house for the marine food chains throughout the world. The growth of the sea ice <coughs> is very important and then in summer the sea ice breaks out and of course by then the krill has expanded into large masses and travelling throughout the oceans of the world as we'll see in, the sec in, a, in a second. So looking at marine and ocean systems, the Antarctic in this slide of course is on the right hand side. You can see the greener water that's closer to the Ant Antarctic here. And during the winter when the sea ice freezes, um, the fresh water freezes out first. Therefore the sea ice is actually quite brackish uh, and when you're working in Antarctica you can now actually tell pretty much the age of the sea ice. If you chip it and taste it you can tell how salty it is and whether it's first year sea ice or second year sea ice or third year sea ice. But as it freezes in the first year then the salt is returned to the ocean and therefore the water is really quite, the cold water that's really close to the continent is also very salty. And so therefore the heavy salty cold water sinks to the bottom of the ocean just like the cold air does on the continent. Uh, this cold water goes along the bottom of the oceans of the world and you can see there it's called Antarctic bottom water. And this is what's called the thermohaline cycle. And of course that has got the food rich marine source um, throughout it and these are now circulating throughout uh, the oceans. Now coming back to the surface of the water, uh, we can see that there is an eastward drift along the coast of Antarctica, that's more of an eddy really that comes along the coast. But then you've got the circumpolar current, so along the surface of the water you can see the circumpolar current uh, which if you're looking at from the, from the uh, sky it'll be going clockwise around the Antarctic or from west to east. And then as that come, you come up further out you can see the polar front there, that's where the the circumpolar water reaches the warmer water of the Pacific and the uh, Atlant uh, Atlantic Oceans uh, and then the colder Antarctic water slips under the warmer water of the uh, Pacific and Atlantic. And this is what's called the uh, Antarctic Convergence where that polar front uh, uh, meets. Actually you can measure the sharp change in temperature of the water as you're sailing south and I've done this several times uh, as you're going down uh, you can see the temperature distinctly drops as you go through that uh, polar front and it could be just in a matter of an hour or two that that change occurs. So you can see from this diagram there's quite a lot of complexity in the ocean currents and of course one of the ones coming back which says here North Atlantic deep water also applies to the Pacific, you've got these feedback loops coming back into the water column midway through the water column and this brings warmer water back towards the Antarctic uh, continent. And if we look here you can see that all of those circulation patterns from the Antarctic bottom water goes up through the oceans and forms part of this conveyor belt system throughout the oceans of the world. You could in effect say that the Gulf Stream, which starts in the Gulf of Mexico and goes up to North 
uh, into Northern Europe is actually part or a remnant of in part of this uh, conveyor belt system which starts in Antarctica and of course on the west coast of South America you've got a current that goes up there as well and as that warms it uh, comes up around the Galapagos Islands uh, this is called the Humboldt current and because of that food rich uh, marine food rich system that comes up around the Galapagos you've got a lot of biodiversity around that area so you can see here that that uh, Antarctic bottom water is feeding pretty much the oceans of the world now if we move on to carbon dioxide uh, carbon dioxide has been recorded in Moana Loa which is in Hawaii and it's the longest continuous record of CO2 and it started in 1958 at 310 parts per million uh, and in 2023 it's got up to about 425 parts per million now 400 parts per million is seen as a bit of a line in the sand uh, the last time there were 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere there were camels walking around in the Arctic and that was two and a half million years ago so this is probably a fairly significant point in the measurement uh, for CO2 we also know that the build-up of CO2 is creating warmer air up around the more temperate climates but now of course that is shifting down to Antarctica and we can see uh, here in the air temperatures for the last 12 months uh, we've got the last the last 12 months of the 12 months hottest months on record so you can see here that red line at the top from May uh, from June 2023 to May 2024 it's quite a bit higher than the rest of the graph which is from June uh, 1940 through to May 2023 so that's quite a big jump uh, in the hottest day in fact uh, the 23rd of July <coughs> this just gone recently 2024 was the hottest day on record and this record is likely to increase over the next days and weeks so what does this mean well in March 2022 there was an atmosphere atmospheric river warm air in the upper atmosphere which brought warm air down to the Antarctic you can see here Concordia station March 2022 they recorded a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius above the normal temperature for that time of the year at the same time Scott base recorded a temperature of 10 degrees above normal for that time of the year now it suggested that these atmospheric streams going from warmer climate to cool climes will continue to increase as climate change uh, continues and of course we've seen the opposite in the enormous northern hemisphere coming the other way where cold air polar domes have been created from the Arctic coming down into particularly Canada and North America and in fact even this week we are talk, talking about a polar dome coming from the Antarctic up towards uh, New Zealand and these patterns are set to continue going forward as climate change continues right so moving on more specifically to climate change <laughs> like we haven't actually talked about it already but you can see here the red dashed line that is the amount of sea ice accumulation in 2023 and you can see there the the gray lines and particularly the sort of hard gray line in the middle is a, the median of 1981 through to 2010 uh, the 2023 accumulation of sea ice was 20 percent less than ever been recorded and this these records are now done from infrared satellites and so forth so it's a fairly accurate record and you can see already in 2024 uh, through to June we're the same sort of pattern of sea ice of less sea ice accumulation through the winter uh, is now being seen so we can see here also <coughs> that um, the ocean of course has been storing CO2 um, throughout time certainly through the industri since the industrial re revolution it has accumulated more CO2 and more heat from the atmosphere uh, giving ourselves a bit of a buffer really uh, in the atmosphere but now it's, all, it's also starting to release CO2 back into the atmosphere at the same time that there is more man-made CO2 going back into the ocean and along with that more heat as well you can see that you know about the the impact of CO2 um, on coral reefs so you can see that that is already taking significant effect in the ocean 
but now we're also warmer water coming through those feedback loops from the oceans from the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans is bringing warmer water uh, back in and starting to melt melt out the, the base of these ice shelves in Antarctica um, and if you want to research more of that um, you can have a look at the Thwaites Glacier T-H-W-A-I-T-E-S, the Thwaites Glacier, if you Google that online you'll see that there's quite a lot of information about what that's happening uh, to the Thwaites Glacier. So what does that mean? Well first of all there's low albedo and that means that there's because there's less sea ice there's less light being reflected back into space and that solar radiation of course is being absorbed uh, in the oceans as well. There's less algae, uh, phytoplankton, diatom, uh, cruel production underneath the sea ice because there's less of it so there's less potentially less cruel production, um, less food going into those marine food chains which is circulating through the oceans uh, of the world more heat as we've seen being absorbed in the southern ocean those deep ocean waters are warming both through the additional solar radiation and the feedback loops coming in through the oceans and of course these marine species now are under threat and it's not just from the warming waters that are happening in Antarctica but other species are now for more temperate climes are moving south as that warmer warts warms and predating on species uh, in the southern ocean and of course it's raining uh, there was never I mean Antarctica is the driest continent on earth typically it's a desert uh, it's so cold that all the moisture freezes out of the atmosphere but that's not the case anymore we're now getting rain and of course penguin tricks chicks are drowning uh, in the meltwater and their down is getting uh, wet uh, their down is not waterproof until they molt and are ready to go to sea but when they're young chicks uh, it is susceptible to getting wet so they're getting wet and freezing melting and uh, drowning in melt pools so there is quite a big change uh, for young uh, chicks quite a high mortality rate now from these from rain and, and melt water and of course the ocean currents are now starting to signal change because of those warmer waters and those feedback loops so moving on to sea level rise you can see that red area there uh, that is around the Thwaites Glacier which is affectionately called the Doomsday Glacier as well but uh, records you can see the blue line on the left hand side <coughs> from 2002 through to 2022 that 22 year period at uh, that 20 year period sorry um, there's been an increase of something like about two and a half gigaton uh, two and a half thousand gigatons sorry uh, extra ice uh, going melting and going back into the oceans of the world now that's two and a half million million metric tons of ice going in the ocean uh, in 2022 that was not going into the ocean in 2002 when they started measuring uh, these records and just in the year uh, from 2022 to 2023 there's something like 150 gigatons of extra ice going in to the ocean in one year so it's 150,000 million metric tons of extra ice going to the ocean that wasn't going into the ocean uh, previously now what does that mean well you can see the white line there it means that there's in 2020 there was about eight millimeters of sea level rise uh, by this from this melting ice going back into the ocean uh, and that is exponential you can see there it's increasing year by year and of course this is year on year as well so by now it's probably about 10 millimeters of sea level rise next year it might be a little bit more than 10 millimeters and, and the year after that and so on and so it's building up most of that of course you can see coming out of West Antarctica which is that area shaded in red there again um, and some of it's coming out of the Antarctic Peninsula but of course ironically in East Antarctica there's actually less ice uh, going in to the oceans and that's being um, but nowhere near offsets the amount of ice coming in uh, from West Antarctica so if we look at the Antarctic this is what it looks like now uh, and this is what it probably looks like uh, or projected to look like if the ice melted off completely uh, now that the the continental ice at the moment sitting on the Antarctica is about 3,000 meters thick in place that's three kilometers thick in some places and as 
the ice melts it's uh, expected that the, the geology the rocks underneath will lift as that weight comes off uh, from the ice and that will also add to the um, increase in sea level rise. Now when I talked about to people about um, sea level rise and I do talk to people about the Antarctic and sea level uh, rise quite a bit I ask them where they think sea level rise is coming from and often they say Greenland and I guess that's because Greenland's been on the tally quite a lot on the TV um, and there's about 0.8 of a meter to come out of Greenland so the, the amount of ice mass left in Greenland could contribute about 0.8 of a meter more to sea level rise in the Antarctic potentially currently locked up in the ice is about 55 meters plus uh, of water uh, that could go into the oceans that's a substantial difference and of course by the year 2300 it's predicted that about five meters of sea level rise uh, will occur um, and this is an estimate of course obviously but every time the scientists go back and measure this stuff it tends to go up not downwards now if you consider there's something like about 10 percent of the world's population currently today that's just under 900 million people live within 10 meters of high tide so it's 900 million people within 10 meters of high tide already the question has to be whether the human race can move quickly enough to make the changes necessary by the year 2300 to accommodate that five meters rise now this is not including uh, the rain that might be coming down on the land the increased um, flood potential um, and the UN also predict that by the year 2050 there's likely to be 1.2 billion climate refugees in the world you can already see that there's climate refugees in the river deltas of Bangladesh, India and Pakistan and in New Zealand itself we already have climate refugees ourselves particularly out on the east coast of the North Island and in Auckland as a, role, as a result of weather events up here notably cycling Gabriel so this is a concern uh, if you factor in uh, both sea level rise and the extra change in weather patterns so let's move and look at the sea surface temperatures you can see here the orange line at the buff at the top there showing 14 months of record sea surface temperatures and if you look at the orangey brown the olively brown line in the middle there that's the mean from 1982 to 2011 so there's a huge difference between the mean of sea surface temperatures uh, and what we're recording now that's probably about what a degree or so of um, temperature rise now if you look if you factor all those things into this very complex picture of the ocean currents in Antarctic you can see uh, that there is quite a lot of uh, potential uh, in the oceans of the world and then if you go back and have a look at that conveyor belt diagram you can see what the flow on effect literally is going to be uh, in the oceans of the world now if we look at plastics and pathogens um, in 2019 plastic was found in 20 percent of the gen 2 stomachs of the gen 2 penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula so this is of concern of course uh, plastic is also now being found in krill and selps which are small jellyfish like creatures which are the basis both of them are the basis of the marine food chain uh, in the oceans of the world but so these are now all being found in Antarctic and of course that moves through the marine food chains as these uh, animals do as well it's estimated about 7% of albatross are also killed while they're foraging getting caught up in plastic or lots of plastic being seen in the stomachs of dead albatross when they've been biopsied after they've died in the ocean you only need to go down to the local beach to see how common plastic is in amongst the ocean on the ocean and on the shore there now in the 1990s a common chicken virus IBDF was found in skewers and penguins in the Antarctic it was thought that this was to have been brought in on chicken products that were used in the Antarctic 
So that's either through the National Antarctic Programs or through tourists coming to Antarctica, taking their chicken sandwiches ashore to have lunch and so forth. Incidentally, no chicken products are now allowed on any cruise ships or certainly not being taken ashore. Um, so that may stop it, but the virus is already there, of course, uh, and circulating amongst the bird species in the Antarctica. And in 2023, avian bird flu H5N1 was also discovered in the Antarctica and is moving across uh, down the Antarctic Peninsula and across into the Ross Sea. Uh, potentially it could come across the Southern Ocean and up through the Subantarctics, heading towards New Zealand. And this may have consequential effects and impacts of course on the New Zealand native species but of course on the poultry industry in New Zealand. But it's also quite a nasty strain of bird flu uh, because it can impact and, and even kill uh, mammals as well. So let's move on to tourism. Tourism started in the 1960s when Lars Lindblad leased a ship and took passengers south then following the establishment of the marine protocols, environmental protocols in 1991-92, uh, the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators was established. So from 1992 the records were being collected on tourism visits to Antarctica and you can see there that they grew right through till about 2006 and then took a big dip uh, when the global, global financial crisis was on and then instead grew steadily through to about 55 tourists in the 2019-2020 uh, season and then dropped away of course because of COVID so theoretically in the 2021-2021 20, uh, season there were no tourists in Antarctica because of COVID but post COVID those numbers have taken off and in the 2022-23 season there was over 100,000 passengers in Antarctica and the numbers for the 2023-24 season have just come through and that's now over 122,000 passengers. So that's almost a 20% increase on the, on the previous year. So now some serious questions are being asked about tourism in Antarctica. There are many benefits and disbenefits of Antarctic tourism. It's not intended that you really read this, actually read this slide, because there's a lot of information in here. Uh, up until recently, of course, Antarctica tourism was seen generating a whole lot of ambassadors for the protection of Antarctica, because there's a lot of education and information imparted on these tourist trips south. As you travel through the oceans to get there, there's normally lectures by experts on Antarctica uh, that are on the ship um, two or three times a day. So people come back from these trips far more knowledgeable about the ecosystems that are happening in Antarctica and then can advocate for them. And of course tourism sustains an industry in a lot of areas around Hobart, Bluff, Ushuaia, Punta Arenas and so forth, Falkland Islands. And so that's probably a billion, maybe up to about a billion and a half dollars now a year. So that's a lot of economic benefits. But on the flip side of course, um, Antarctic tourism has been separated by cost. It has to be uh, what I term filtered by finance. You need to have quite a bit of money to get there. And so people that have gone there, of course, um, are decision makers and influencers in their own uh, world and their own economic and private lives and so therefore there is some benefit to that but it has been separated but now we're moving from frontier tourism into mass tourism those prices are starting to drop and related to that of course is a very high cost value satisfaction experience depending on the weather whether the weather window is only about three months and of course it can be influenced quite substantially by weather events and sea ice and so you may not even make some of the landings um, that you're expecting to, to make because of the weather and so that changes people's perception and satisfaction of that trip as well but of course environmentally there's now positive and negative event, events um, and there is now quite a bit more uh, focus, I guess, on those environmental impacts. And of course, we know there have been disasters in Antarctica, the DC-10 crash on Mount Erebus, of course, the Lindblad Explorer, you can see on the right-hand side, capsized as well. Uh, a Chilean vessel was carrying passengers in 1989, capsized, spilling 640,000 litres of fuel oil into the ocean. So the chance of a 
disaster here uh, in a very complex uh, space can affect rescues and so forth. On the flip side of that, of course, there's something like close to 600 voyages going south every year to the Antarctica. That's not 600 different ships. Um, that's some ships doing many trips each year. But that does mean that there are more people in the area and so the rescue by other tourist operators actually increase, not decrease. But now it's uh, calculated that every tourist trip south, that's every 10 to 12 day tourist trip in the Antarctica is equivalent to about 4 tonnes of CO2 emissions. And that's about what the rest of us do in a year. So they, their short trip is equivalent to about a year for us. And because of that, it's calculated also that each of those tourists um, are responsible for about 830 tonnes of snow melt because of that extra CO2. Most of these ships are still diesel electric, so they are still using fuel, uh, and it's calculated that there's around 10 million, probably higher than that, around 12 million litres of fuel oil being used every year. And of course the carbon emissions, the hydrocarbons from those coming off are being emitted in a very pristine environment. So the real questions now are how many tourists are too many in Antarctica uh, and what management mechanisms can be put in place uh, to manage these tourists. So let's move on to biodiversity and fishing. Ironically, of course, uh, whaling, sealing and penguin, penguining uh, opened up and helped the discovery of Antarctica. Uh, the oil was literally used to light the, la the lamps of London uh, in the 1700s and 1800s. And of course, it was used in a range of products from cosmetics to food and so on. It wasn't until mineral oil from the earth, uh, the fossil oils from the earth were being extracted in sufficient quantity uh, that the demand for whale and seal oil dropped off. Uh, the whaling, International Whaling Commission was established in 1948. There is still only one nation whaling in Antarctica and that's Japan. They uh, say it's for scientific uh, purposes and there's been quite a lot of debate around that. And of course New Zealand can't take really the moral high ground here because whaling in New Zealand of course was not actually outlawed itself until 1978. In 1982 the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources or affectionately known as CAMELA was established to look after those marine species in Antarctica t t typically south of 60 degrees. There have been some questions raised about the efficiency of Camelar, of course, and how su successful it is in managing and ensuring compliance of fishing and protecting those marine living manuals, mammals. So that's an ongoing discussion, discussion around Camelar. In 2017, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area was established, uh, and this is in th sort of three different types of areas, five areas, three different types. So there's three generally protected zones. You can see there one close to the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, one up around Scott Island and one out towards the 60 degree south boundary. Uh, there's one special krill, uh, research, oh, one special research area just off the Ross Sea there and one krill research area up round in the northeast there around Commonwealth Bay. So these have been set up uh, under the Camilla uh, under the uh, Camelar Convention. So therefore the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area is tied to what happens to Camelar, which when that convention is uh, renegotiated in 2052. So it'll be interesting to see uh, whether that's replaced and what it's replaced with. So along with climate change and pathogens, fishing and biodiversity, uh, sea level um, rise and so forth, most of the, this, in fact virtually all of this, is, is dependent on what happens off the continent, away from Antarctica, back here in the real world, not really what's happening on the continent itself. So we need to be aware of the fact of what we do er every day in our daily lives is now impacting on Antarctica and of course the impacts those are now flowing back from Antarctica towards us as well. So. Moving on to the New Zealand Antarctic Society, given all of that information that we've just seen, um, post-COVID the Antarctic decided, decided it needed to take a very serious look at itself uh, and what it was doing. It needs to get its head above the parapet and start talking about the stuff. So we've re redone our strategic direction 
and we're looking to take Antarctica to the world. So the values we're living by really uh, is our guardianship and, and we uh, want to advocate on behalf of the Antarctic obviously uh, and also our credibility. We are an independent organisation that's really important that we can stand up and talk about things where other organisations can't. Uh, we want to increase our inclusive, uh, inclusiveness in the organisation and we want to build healthy relationships with other organisations, environmental organisations, Antarctic organisations, government agencies and so forth so we can start spreading this information uh, around. And of course uh, our key asset is our membership. Uh, most people that are in the Antarctic Society, not all, but most people have worked in Antarctica at some stage and so there's a lot of knowledge and information contained within the membership but as I say you don't need to be have worked in the Antarctic to be a member you can just join and be part of it. So what we have done is we've moved away from what we're terming a Victorian society uh, to an environmental organisation. So this is what uh, we've, we're moving towards and to do that we have five areas of activity. We have an, uh, a science and advocacy group uh, that are working with a whole lot of agencies uh, and talking uh, to them, making submissions on policy, providing advice uh, and advocating on behalf of us. We have a communication group which is looking at the platforms um, that we want to communicate on, what the target audiences are, uh, and we have an editorial group that looks after our flagship, flagship magazine and other publications we produce. Our magazine The Antarctic has been running since 1956, so there's a large archive of information material on there as well. Now through an arrangement through EBSCO, the subscription service, an international subscription service, this magazine can be available through 150,000 plus libraries throughout the world. We also have an education outreach group which are looking at the content of the messages that we're going to put out uh, and how they're going to and how we communicate those. Uh, the Education Outreach Group is also looking at building relationships with other organisations uh, and how collectively we can work together to get more information out there. And of course we have a stewardship committee. We must recognise that the Antarctic Society has been running since 1933, so it's over 90 years old. We have a lot of information on history and what we've been doing and what we've been going. I only need to mention a few names like Sir Edmund Hillary, Arnold Heine, Colin Monteith, Margaret Bradshaw and Peter Barrett to, for you to understand that actually the Antarctic is part of our cultural heritage in Antarctica. It's not just the heritage of the society uh, but also of New Zealand itself. So we need to protect that heritage, uh, record it, digitalise it uh, and maintain it. In the meantime, over the last couple of years, we've been establishing and building good processes in governance as well. So we now start building our funding and capacity. So that's our next stage really, is to build up that uh, funding and capacity so we can generate a whole lot of material to send out uh, and so people can become aware uh, of going forward. So why is this important to us? <coughs> well, this is why it's important to me. These are two of my grandchildren. And you think about the time scales that we've been talking about. In their lifetime, the world is going to be quite differently, quite different. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you think about their grandchildren, the world is going to be quite different again. <coughs> so this is a very good reason for me to be doing this. There may be a very similar or very good reason why you need to be involved. And we hope that you can uh, engage and help sh us share these messages uh, rest of the, with the rest of the world. So you can use this QR code, you can click on it and take to our membership page, you can join the Antarctic Society if you wish, if you're not already, uh, or you can make a donation uh, to the Antarctic Society as well, which, which will allow us to get some leverage and movement forward with this messaging. So add your voice to Antarctica. Thank you very much.